Good morning, Mr. Zoh, Mr. Go Chen, and Mr. Go Kai Song. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Nathan, and today I will be presenting about the COVID-19 analytics dashboard harnessing descriptive and predictive analytics. My industry partner is IPRD Solutions. IPRD believes in using technology for the greater good. Some of their past work involve COVID-19 Bluetooth contact tracing on Google and Apple phones, as well as global vaccination certificates. Some of their key partners include public healthcare organizations in countries like Africa and Nigeria, as well as international health organizations like WHO. In fact, many of the, uh, many of the organizations they have worked with span the entire globe as well. Some of the problems that I identified include the limited COVID-19 tracking in developing countries. Secondly, the lack of accessible real healthcare data that can be used for software development or for data analytics, as well as the lack of frameworks and standard pipelines to utilize insights from COVID-19 data. My solution aims to solve these problems. In line with that, my, project ob my primary project objective is to develop a comprehensive COVID-19 analytics dashboard. This dashboard aims to help healthcare providers and the public to understand COVID-19 related symptoms and factors. As part of it, the secondary objective is also to develop a standard ETL pipeline to extract data from the fire server and transform it to be useful for analytics. You may wonder what is a fire server? We will go through that a bit later in the presentation. And also, I want to perform unsupervised clustering to segment patients based on their demographics, that is their age, their gender, as well as healthcare data that we have about them. So if this sounds interesting, let's get right into it. My project scope involves three main components. One of them is the COVID-19 analytics dashboard. And you can see the preview here. The ETL pipeline that takes data from the server to the data warehouse, as well as predictive analytics, more specifically, k-means clustering. Some of the technologies that I use include the fast healthcare interoperability resource, fire server and fire data pipes. The fire server is a type of server that manages different kinds of healthcare resources. So things like your patients, their conditions, encounters, and so forth. One key component of all of these technologies are that they are free and open source. This means that it's much easier for us to scale whatever we have done. And it's, this is very important because many of the things we are doing are intended for the global public healthcare sector. This is, in many countries, there are third world countries, um, there are much less resources available for us to scale these, uh, these components. And so free and open source and availability as containerized images is very important. All of our technologies can be deployed on Docker desktop on premises as well as on the cloud using technologies like Kubernetes and AWS Elastic Compute Service. The overall data pipeline is as follows. We start off by synthetically generating our patients. Then we go on to the fire server. We post them to the server. Then we perform ETL. And when all the data is loaded into the data warehouse, then it's ready for visualization and predictive analytics. Now let's go a bit further into each of these components. We first start off with the synthetic patient generation where we create synthetic electronic health records. So what's an electronic health record? That's basically the, a record of you and every single condition, every time you visit the healthcare provider and every time you get immunization for any disease. This of course, we don't get access to all these data, so we need to generate them synthetically. But we generate them based on regional demographic data that we already know. In order to customize it to different demographics, I actually decided to add different conditions. So things like pneumonia, hyposemia, I've actually added conditions related to COVID-19, as well as adapting them to the Indian demographic. You may wonder why, why is this so necessary? Why is there so much work? is because Cynthia is only meant for the US population. It's only meant for US demographic. So in order to, to customize it for different regions, I needed to change some of the demographic files, as you can see here. 
some of the benefits of using Cynthia are that it doesn't require any real patient data, which is very important because I don't have real patient data and most governments are unwilling to give up their, their private data for testing purposes. It's also highly customizable, so I can add different kinds of conditions based on my research. And I can customize the age, region, and conditions that the patients have. It is also highly scalable. Being software-based, I can create 10 patients, or if I want, I can also create 10 million patients. Now we move on to the Fire Server. After all the patient records are generated, we can post them over to the Fire Server. And in fact, all of these resources, like patient, observation, condition, encounter, and so forth, all of these reside within the Fire Server. Some of the benefits of using a Fire Server are that it works, it's open source and works with a global fast healthcare interoperability resource or Fire. And how, just how great is the extent of Fire in the healthcare industry? Well, here's a statistic. Fire it works with over 90% of US healthcare providers as of 2021. So that's more than 90% in this very fragmented healthcare world. Over 90% of healthcare providers is really a vast majority. And it's also very flexible being able to be deployed on premises or in the cloud. Now we move on to the very interesting part about the ETL pipeline. So my ETL pipeline takes the data from the fire server, transforms it and loads it into the Apache Hive data warehouse. And the ETL pipeline involves two major components, the Fire Data Pipes, as you can see here, and PySpark. Well, in the Fire server, resources are stored as JSON files. And as we know with JSON files, they are very deeply nested. So Fire Data Pipe has inbuilt mapping, and it can take all of those resources and make it into a tabular format, which makes it much more easy for analysis and for transformation. So when it becomes tabular format, we put it into PySpark, where we can use Python and SQL. So this is one of the benefits. Fire Data Pipe has inbuilt mapping to, build, to map all of the resources from the Fire Server to a tabular format. And PySpark is highly flexible because we use Python and SQL. Let's look at some of, some of the tables, some examples of that. The nested table, as you can see here, this is one example of the, um, of the procedures. You can see how nested this is. It has a lot of information, but it's all contained within um, many layers of nesting. It's very deeply nested, and that's very hard to deal with. But all this data is still important. So we use SQL within the PySpark to actually take out some of this information and put them into a single level table, which means one set of rows, one set of columns, much easier to analyze. But by doing so, by selecting what we need to map, we can actually use all the data that we need without dealing with the complexity of nested structures. Here's an example, another example in PySpark. What do we do in PySpark? The resource tables, one example is the patient flat table. It has information like name, gender, age, and location. Okay, that's fine. But all of us, all of these resource tables exist as different tables. So we have a patient table, we have a condition table, we have an encounter table, we have many different tables, and that's a little bit difficult to do for visualization. So what we do is we have a consolidated view as well. Using SQL, we join most of these together with different subqueries and put them into one giant consolidated table. It has all the information based on the patients, their conditions, encounters, immunization, and location. Why do we need this? That's because it's much easier to do visualization and to do predictive analytics based on a single data set that's already been joined. But all of these resource tables are still available for us to query as well. So at this point in our pipeline, we have taken the fire resources, we have performed ETL on it, and the data is ready, so it's loaded into the Hive data warehouse. And from the Hive data warehouse, it is ready for visualization and predictive analytics. So for data visualization, I've cho chosen to use Apache Superset. Why do I use Apache Superset? That's because it's a free and open source visualization tool used by the biggest companies in the world like Tesla and OpenTable. It is highly scalable and uses a cloud native framework, meaning that it's easy to deploy on different cloud services. So at this point, let's look at the data visualization and my COVID-19 analytics dashboard. So this is a dashboard. It starts off with an introduction and two big number charts to showcase 
the most important metrics, like number of cases and the vaccination rate, both of which are very important. Then we can go on to the number of cases where we see a line chart and a world map that helps us to compare the number of cases across different regions in the world. I would just like to share some of the takeaways that I have noticed. Notice this group bar chart over here. You notice that for the young people, 10 to 19, all the way to around 50 to 59, the number of COVID cases, or rather the percentage of people who get COVID, is significantly lower for those who, have, who are fully vaccinated. You can see this trend for young people and for middle-aged people. This means that it is very advantageous for them to get va vaccinated so that they can get immunity to COVID-19. In the symptoms and recovery section, we notice some of the most common uh, conditions that we get, fever, cough, loss of taste, fatigue, and spartan finding. So these are the most common and that we all know that. But notice the line chart. It is fairly consistent when things increase, the number of COVID cases increase, all of the other, okay, uh, all of the other conditions also increase proportionally. This means that for, for, uh, among all of this time period, from early 2020 all the way to late 2021, where there's a lot of different COVID variants and so forth, the symptoms still is pretty consistent across the entire time range. This is quite interesting. That means that COVID symptoms tend to be quite consistent even across uh, different variants and different time periods. We also notice that the time to recover, it averages around 20 to 22 days across all of the symptoms. This means that people who have felt fall ill with COVID-19 should try to stay home for at least three days, or for at least three weeks. In the hospital visit section, notice something interesting. The symptom detector increases from October to the 2021, uh, 2020 to around February 2021. And this is also consistent for the orange line over here for quarantine. So for both symptom detected and quarantine, it increases quite a lot. Notice the green line though, the vaccination line. Notice how the vaccination line increases also very sharply, but it increases about three months later, starting from January 2021. This shows the importance of public awareness. When people are aware there's a lot of COVID cases happening, they're much, much more willing to get vaccinated and take preventive measures because they know this is a real thing. This is something that they need to be aware of. Okay, now we'll move on to the next section, which is the past disorders. Notice that most of the disorders are respiratory in nature, with 68% of individuals. So you notice that pneumonia, hyposemia, and acute respiratory failure are some of the most common disorders among COVID patients. This means that patients who have past respiratory conditions should, take, should be more careful about contracting COVID-19 as they are much more likely to do so. Now we can move on to the next section on predictive analytics. So the predictive analytics section, I've chosen to do unsupervised learning, more specifically K-means clustering. The aim is to segment patients by their demographics, like their age and gender, as well as past healthcare data, which is their conditions, immunizations, and so forth. The goal is that we want to discover patterns in these clusters. And from these patterns, this can inform healthcare providers to perform better targeted healthcare strategies and to develop them for their patients. In order to do that, first we need to understand the comparison between different clusters. So I've made three clusters from the KMIS clustering and I've compared them with different charts. For example, this chart, this radar chart over here compares the characteristics by looking at their means of each of the clusters. Now, then I also plotted a 100% stack bar plot for the COVID-19, the chances of getting COVID-19, as well as a violin plot to understand their age distribution. Then I've also gone on to create a shared summary plot for each of the clusters. So we understand what is the most important, um, uh, what is the most important feature that contributes to the prediction for each cluster. So here are some of the takeaways. I noticed that for cluster zero, which is the one, the OBAR goal over here, for cluster zero, it tends to be older with a mean age of about 77 years. They generally exhibit low COVID-19 prevalence rate, so they have pretty few COVID-19 cases, 
but they so they tend to be quite healthy despite their age. This highlights that they tend to actually have good healthcare management strategies and they tend to not fall sick so often. Cluster 1, on the other hand, is the one that falls sick very often. And you can see that from the chat plot, the conditions is like super to the right. So this means that they have a lot of healthcare conditions and most notably, they also have disorders. Well, notice that re respiratory disorders actually play a pretty big role. And then we go back to the 100% stack bar plot, we notice the cluster 1 has all of the COVID patients, 100% of them. So this means that respiratory conditions like pneumonia and hypoxemia can really uh, contribute to a person's getting COVID-19, the chances of getting COVID-19. Now we go on to cluster 2, which is the final one, and we notice something interesting. It's young and sweet, which is basically all of the young people. The violin plot highlights this. You can see that all of them are young people in this, uh, in this chart over here. And notably, many of these young people have high COVID-19 vaccination rates, and they also have immunizations for a lot of other diseases. So we can see that both age and their high immunization are some of the key features contributing to this particular cluster. So this means that young people in general tend to have good immunization strategies and healthcare management. And this is very good. This helps to mitigate the risk of COVID-19. So some of the benefits of unsupervised clustering include targeted messaging. Whatever we just saw is just a very clear reminder that different healthcare groups and different clusters can have very, very varying uh, needs and strategies. Therefore, healthcare providers can have more targeted messaging targeted at them, and they can use the clustering to have better planning and resource optimization to optimize the resources for those who need it. Let's look at the business impact of this. The COVID-19 analytics dashboard actually provides healthcare providers with a flexible, well-designed dashboard. This allows them to have better actionable insights for decision making. If the dashboard is publicized, it can also lead to increased public awareness because now people are allowed, they can explore the COVID-19 situation themselves and get their own data for what they want to and inform themselves about the COVID-19 situation. The ETL data pipeline provides better operational efficiency by semi-automating the ETL process improving the business efficiency and allowing large-scale data to be managed and transformed automatically. It is also very customizable for different needs, being uh, mainly relying on Python and SQL, meaning that most data analysts will simply be able to get started and get their own data from it. Predictive analytics helps healthcare providers to form tailored healthcare strategies. And one example will be COVID-19 vaccination ads. Or for example, for the cluster with, that gets sick very often, they can send them leaflets or emails encouraging them to get vaccinated or even to get a booster vaccine if they've already, uh, they already gotten their original one. So next, we'll go on to scalability and maintainability of this project. This project has flexible deployment options as all of the components are open source and they come as containerized images. This means they can be easily deployed on-premises and in the cloud. And testing has shown that cloud services can handle at scale fire servers. You may wonder, at what scale? Google Cloud has actually tested, and the fire server works with up to 50 million patients, over 1 billion records. It is also easy to customize, and the ETL and ML workflows are done in Python and SQL. This enables data analysts to extract their own data for analysis. Future enhancements that I would like to make to this project include the exploration of cloud deployment. As mentioned, a lot of these can be easily deployed to the cloud. And to prepare the demographic data for different regions beyond US and India, maybe I can try other countries as well. I would also like to, de to develop more dashboards aimed at different audiences. This one is a general purpose one for both healthcare providers and the public. We can make different ones, ones targeted at healthcare, pro healthcare professionals like doctors, one for higher management, maybe one for public. And I would like to explore different clustering and dimensionality reduction methods. For dimensionality reduction, there's T-SNE, and there's also clustering, there's others like hierarchical and DB scan. Some of the lessons that I've learned from this project are adaptability and continuous learning to always find resources on our own, 
and organizational skills to work and communicate well with the, with the supervisor and industry partner. These are the technical skills like Docker desktop, containerized images, and big data processing tools. And with that, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And do you have any questions for me? Okay. No worries. Do you, can, can you just quickly just show your live demo, the interactivity of the cash box? Okay, sure. So for this dashboard, you'll notice that there are different um, there are different sections. So Superset provides a web page like interface. So you can see this is like a web page, and it can be hosted online. So people can just go on this website on their browser and interact with it. Each can, can I just keep in there? Correct. Yeah. So there, there is a section over here under vaccination rate by state use as filter. You can actually select different uh different states. And then once you click one state, it will automatically start filtering in the back end and it will actually provide the results. Unfortunately for Windows, it's a little bit slower because it's running uh, the Linux back end. This is where my live demo takes a while. Because <laughs> of the size of the data. Yeah, because of the size of the data. And also because we're running a uh, Docker desktop and Docker desktop runs a Linux backend on a Windows laptop. So it takes a while. Um, it's not working. Why? Yeah, uh, that is what this Then maybe just a bit of the comment is, uh, you started by talking about developing and developed country, India versus US. Uh -huh. Yeah, then you suddenly took a turn and on the dashboard, you focus more on symptoms versus stock. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, so you might want to think about your story, right? especially for the PG. Okay. Make, make the story more consistent. Okay. I think the goal is actually really to compare different states. Um, between different states, what are the findings for each of these? And allow users to actually filter by all these findings so that they can actually get the overall view. So they can get an overall view of all of the, all of the countries combined. And also to be able to filter down by individual states and allow them to see what are the findings for each state by using the filter on the dashboard. Yeah. So uh, I like the how you use the radar chart to show the uh -huh. uh, profile of the three, three clusters that you've got. Yeah. The slide 40 one, the one I oh. already, already, I mean, that one is a bit confusing for me, at least, because uh, the y-axis, um, okay, on the point of horizontal axis, those uh, features are, Different actually across the three clusters. So the hard when you when people read it, it that to take out of that. Right. Uh the good if they say they are arranged the same. Then okay. it becomes more like a you know, like a the, the, having the common marker and, and see the PMA for each of the clusters. I see. Yeah. So that that part, uh, this one one I think one bit other can be improved for future reference. Okay, I understand. Uh, then I have a question about the because when you talk about patterning and drawing the, the tables, yes, uh, in my mind, I was thinking that it probably will lead to some form of uh, performance deterioration because essentially what you end up with is a huge thing where everything gets slowed slow down by it. So I want to ask whether you will face that or not. Uh, generally, for my tables, what I've done is to create a consolidated table already. So instead of Performing uh, for the con you're talking about the consolidated view, right? Just to clarify, this one when I join everything together, then it leads to performance loss. So what I actually do to mitigate this is that in the ETL pipeline itself, I already create another table for it. So I I join everything together, then I create another table. I write a query so that during the ETL process, it actually transforms all of these uh, columns to the new table. So the new table doesn't need to read from all the original tables. Um, yeah, when it's actually performing the dashboard query. 
So this leads to much better performance because uh, all of these tables, they are going to take quite long, but this is during the ETL part, during the ETL process itself, not during the querying for the analysis or for visualization. So uh, to add one up on it too, uh, just during the teachings, uh, the SAM uh, analytics maybe from the uh, mm -hmm. IT. So we got other one with really the SAM technical chance like subquery. Oh, okay. So that will be a kind of SAM on this view. Okay, I understand. The intentions semi automatic ETL. Yes. Uh, in your concluding slide. Mm. Right, just curious which part is, is the not, not automated. But in fact, the only reason why I said semi automated is that you got to click the button. You got to click the button. So for example, if I showcase it now, uh, I can open up the my Spark Tree Server die. Yeah, so for example, something like this in Fire Pipelines. The, to run the process, I just press Run Full. So I press the Run Full button, and it runs the process. So that's the part that's not really automated right now. I have to press the Run Full button. And for the PySpark one, I just need to go to the Py to Jupyter Notebook, press Run All. So all of this actually can be automated if I run it on a cloud platform instead. So let's say if I put it on, if I set maybe PySpark on a Lambda function or ECS, Elastic Compute Service, I can set it to actually run on schedule instead. So instead of having to press that one button, I instead set it to run on schedule. That will make it fully automated instead of semi-automated. So what part we I'm seeing here now is the fire data pipes, so as uh, the ETL pipeline has two components. It has the fire data pipes, oops, sorry. Fire data pipes, which is this one, and it has PySpark. So fire data pipes is built by fire. PySpark is just a framework that allows us to query and allow us to query the server, allow us to make different operations on the server. But PySpark, everything inside PySpark has to be coded in SQL and Python by me. So the Fire Data Pipes part is already done by Fire. PySpark is done by me. Yeah. So for example, the web page just now is... This web page is Fire Data Pipes. So it's already created by Fire to map the resources. I just need to select what resources that I want, which is over here. Cynthia, is this something that is outside fire or is outside? Uh, Cynthia is an open source uh, project that was uh, done by MIT. So Cynthia actually is outside of fire, but it works with fire resources. So it generates patients in fire format. So if you want to look at this, I can show you the Cynthia, how it looks like on the back end. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. The zoom works. To a certain extent. In fact, uh, that's, that's the reason why in my dashboard currently, I actually put a notice at the top that says that, yeah, this is synthetically generated data. It will not be very accurate. So as written in my report, the data is that the most of the generation is actually based on a couple years ago data about COVID-19. So the regional data is all from a couple years ago. Um, the, the, the way that they generate is based on trends that were in the past, which is why I didn't find it very appropriate to generate data. I didn't notice from my dashboard. I didn't generate up to 2024 because I felt that it really didn't represent, it would be quite misleading because we're using trends from the past to generate data in the present. And I don't think that's very realistic for, and I think that's not very good lah, for us to mislead in that way. So that's why I, I think that Cynthia we needs to be constantly updated, lah, which is a challenge. Yeah. But it's realistic enough for analytics and development development uh, purposes. Uh, just that one, um, in your for us, you didn't mention about any challenges. So it's good to indicate some challenges how we did go back. Okay. That yeah, it's good just to, uh, to maybe instead of listening that to the back to change it to challenges. Yeah, because I, I know that you struggle with those, but yeah. Okay, Ken. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're actually planning to showcase this project for TP Infotech Day. Yeah, I'm actually liaising with uh, Mr. Zaw and Mr. 
and the IPRD solutions. That, the entire right, so to be, uh, to be accept in to get, you know, they, they, they took it back and they are now also showcasing to, to the other uh, NGO and do right, exhibition. That means you will pass back the, the doctor files and get uh, have, I have not done so yet, but I'll be planning to do so for the purpose of the TP InfoTech Day and also for them to showcase to their partners. So the Docker files is one thing that's good about Docker is that it's containerized. So we can easily, in fact, I've actually exported all of the Docker containers really. So they can be easily shared to other and, and deployed on other platforms. Yeah, such as other people's Docker desktop. Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you. At this point, my laptop's fans are going really loud. <laughs>